Hi everyone, my name is Terry and welcome to my channel. Would you like to know what these three things have in common? Stick around and I'll explain it all right here on The Pink Dumbbell Problem. Many regular viewers of my channel will be expecting some fitness content and sorry friends, but not today. Today is all about agnotology. Now I've done a few short videos about agnotology already on this channel and I'll put the links to those in the box down below if you need a primer. Very quickly, agnotology is the philosophy of ignorance. It's sort of like the opposite of epistemology, but instead of questioning how we know, it's how we don't know. And more importantly, it's all about looking at what kinds of knowledge are being suppressed and kept out of our reach. Here's the official definition from Dr. Robert Proctor, who started creating this concept in 1995. Our primary purpose here is to promote the study of ignorance by developing tools for understanding how and why various forms of knowing have not come to be or disappeared or have been delayed or long neglected for better or for worse at various points in history. The idea is that a great deal of attention has been given to epistemology, or the study of how we know, when how or why we don't know is often just as important, usually far more scandalous and remarkably under-theorized. One focuses on knowledge that could have been but wasn't, or should be but isn't, but we shall also see that not all ignorance is bad. I want to go a little deeper into one particular branch of agnotology, and that is strategic ploy. And in order to do that, I'm going to take you through three stories from three different decades from the history of popular music. And that idea that ignorance isn't always a bad thing is what we're going to look at in the first two stories. But um, this is kind of fitness instructor looking, isn't it? I think I need to look a little more rock and roll. Hang on a sec. There we go. That's more like it. Back to my old self. And I do mean my old self. My hair has not done this in a couple of decades. There's three branches of agnotology. The first is called native state, and it's the one most of us are in about most things. It is simply not having had any interaction with a particular area of knowledge, and therefore we don't know about it. Nobody can know about all of it. The second one is called Lost Realm, and that's what happens when bits of information, pieces of knowledge, areas of knowing, ways of knowing, are lost to the mists of time. And in agnotology, we specifically want to study what was lost, or more often than not, what was suppressed. The third is strategic ploy. Now, strategic ploy is what happens when ignorance or misinformation is deliberately created and spread through a community or even worldwide. And it's done for somebody's benefit somewhere along the way. To show you how this works, I'm gonna tell you stories about three famous musicians, and we're gonna look at where urban legends about rock star, artsy diva behavior end, and where agnogenesis begins. Before we jump into the agnotology, I want to mention a couple of things just for the context of this video. The first is that I'm not going to play any interview pieces, any music videos, or play any music clips from the artists themselves. The legal uh, requirements to do so and the cost to do so is just too far beyond such a small channel like mine. And the idea of doing that without legally getting that cleared is absolutely unthinkable. If I did that, these guys could sue me into oblivion. Where is oblivion anyway? The other bit of context here is that all of the celebrities I'm going to talk about have had some problematic behaviors in their past. And my including them in this video is not to condone that behavior or glamorize that. I'm including them in this video because they're really excellent examples of agnotology. Back in 1993, Prince shocked the world by changing his name. And not only changing it, he changed it to an unpronounceable symbol. And we all had to start referring to him as the artist formerly known as Prince, because what were you going to call this? The spin at the time, and this came directly from Prince himself, was that this was a vision he had and he was doing this to fulfill his artistic interests. Partially kind of true, Meh, maybe not entirely. And we accepted this because it was coming from him directly and also because, you know, he was an artsy guy, right? Like artsy people do artsy things. So yeah, okay, sure, change your name to something we can't say. 
And then just as inexplicably, he changed it back again to Prince in 2000. So why was there this seven year stint of this unpronounceable name? Turns out in 93, Prince was under contractual obligation with his record label Warner to make five more albums under the name Prince. And he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to do things in the direction they were taking it. He, did, he wanted to honestly go in a more artsy direction and do different things that the label wouldn't approve of. And since he was under contractual obligation to make the, the new albums under the name Prince, Prince changed his name. This did not by any means solve his legal problems with his record label, but it definitely kept them busy. And it gave him time to figure out other ways to do things and to make other projects without having to do the recording, the touring, the launches, all the other stuff that goes with promoting a record for a big label. And Prince certainly had the content. He was a prolific songwriter. That wasn't the problem. It's that he didn't want to do it on their terms and on their timeline. So that's why he did it. That is the agnogenesis of this story. And agnogenesis is exactly what you're probably thinking right now. It's the moment where the agnotology all began. And Prince was doing all of the PR spin side of this to the public. And behind the scenes, he was irritating his way out of his contract with Warner. Smart guy, that Prince. There's an example of using ignorance for a positive outcome. Now, granted, I don't think Warner would agree it was that positive. Uh, he was definitely a thorn in their side, but ultimately it worked out in his favor contractually. And it's generally agreed that what Prince did was a benefit for all musicians to come after him. There was a lot of large record companies and labels who were doing predatory contracts, especially in the 70s and 80s. And Young artists were signing on, not realizing what they were getting obligated to. That's kind of what happened to Prince when he first signed on. And he was one of several artists who really stood up and, and put the brakes on that with predatory record labels. So ultimately, he did a great thing for a lot of people. But what happens when the stakes aren't just contracts and money? What happens if people's safety or even their very lives are on the line? Q Van Halen. Prince managed his name change on the reputation of artsy people being artsy, and it worked. But Van Halen took that idea and, well, let's just say they dialed it up to 11. Now, this is also where urban legends enter the mix. Prince's story wasn't an urban legend because he was telling the story himself. An urban legend is a story that's untrue, but it's told as if it is true, and it's spread from person to person over time. Generally, there has to be some element of uh, familiarity or being able to relate to the people or the situation in the story. And with musicians or any celebrities, that's really easy. And that's why there's so many urban legends about famous people, is we feel we know them. More typical urban legends are the sort of thing that starts off with, well, my cousin's mother-in-law's hairdresser knew a guy who blah, 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 whatever the story is that happened. When it happens with famous people, we don't have to have that relationship to somebody we kind of vaguely know somebody who knows somebody thing. We know them or we feel we know them. We know their art, uh, we know their songs or if it's actors, we know their TV shows and movies. That kind of takes the relationship a little closer. Now, the music industry is riddled with urban legends. You've probably heard at least a few of the most famous ones, things like Elvis is alive and Paul is dead and Ozzy and Alice can't be trusted around small winged creatures. So here's what happened. In the early 80s, when Van Halen was reaching megastar status, their tours were getting bigger and so was their reputation for their over-the-top rock star behavior. I mean, these guys are really part of the reason that whole stereotype about rock stars exists in the first place. And as much as it seemed at the time, like they were just, you know, young guys having a good time, and, and to some extent, that's definitely what was happening. There were, turns out there was some strategic ploy agnotology happening. And we know that because David Lee Roth himself told us all about it years later when it was finally okay to reveal what he was really up to. So Van Halen got a reputation not only for big shows and big parties, but for big egos. And one of the stories that went around that sounded too good to be true, but 
apparently everybody knew this, was that they had meltdowns, absolute hissy fits backstage at concerts because there was brown M&Ms in the bowl in the green room backstage. So the trick with the M&Ms was that it was buried in the rider. Now, when a band goes in to perform in a venue, there's the standard contract that does all the money parts of the, of the situation. But there's another piece of the contract called the rider, and that's where all the technical specs are. And that's everything from things like catering requirements to how much electricity they need to run the sound and light equipment and to how much load the stage can bear. And these guys were coming in with a couple of truckloads of amplifiers and lighting rigs, so they needed to know that the stage was big enough and strong enough to hold all of that equipment. The clause about the M&Ms was buried in the rider amongst all this other technical stuff. And the clause was that if there was any brown M&Ms in the bowl, the venue would forfeit the entire gig and all the money related to it. So here's the thing. If David Lee Roth, who is, the, by the way, the guy who was flying around above the stage in a harness during shows, walked into the green room and saw, saw brown M&Ms in the bowl, everything came to a screeching halt. They would do an entire line check of every piece of equipment in the show. It was too risky otherwise. A stage could have collapsed, there could have been electrocutions, there could have been any number of problems that could have maimed or killed Dave himself, his bandmates, his road crew, the audience in front. I realize that probably sounds a bit like hyperbole, but stage collapses have killed fans at concerts before, so the danger was very, very real. So that's what Dave and the guys did, but just putting that in the contract isn't gonna work on its own. They had to play it up and make it seem like this wasn't just a trick to make the, the venue operators read the contract, but that they were actually having meltdowns over a bowl of candy. The truth was they were keeping everyone safe and they were doing strategic ploy agnotology. They were deliberately spreading what many people saw as an unsavory rumor or a bit of gossip about themselves and letting that flourish out in the world with, you know, their own reputations as individual good people, maybe taking a fair beating in the process. But ultimately, they did a good thing. There you have it, folks. David Lee Roth, agnotologist. Yeah, heard it here first. You know, stories like this kind of make me wonder if this might be where old theater taboos came from, like it's bad luck to whistle backstage or you can't say the name of Shakespeare's Scottish play. Did these maybe serve as a safety or financial function in a previous production that just outlasted the show? Could be. Ignorance doesn't tend to stick around if somebody's not benefiting from it. And the best way to find out who's benefiting in what way? Follow the money. So with Prince, we believed him because artsy artists are artsy. And with Van Halen, we believe them because this is just what rock stars do. And to be fair, lots of rock stars were doing this in the 80s. It was a pretty normal thing. But there's another element at work here. These make for good stories. I mean, hey, Prince didn't change his name to John now, did he? And as Dave himself said in his biography when he revealed the truth about the M&Ms, who am I to get in the way of a good rumor? Also important here is that these artists were telling the stories themselves and that affects how we relate to the story. These are famous people. We know them. We know their music. We feel a relationship or a kinship with them. So we don't have to have that element of my mother's cousin's hairdresser's mother-in-law to make the story feel like it happened to somebody near us. We feel adjacent to it because these are celebrities that we follow. We know their art. And that's a really important factor in why these stories spread. We trust them. That's exactly why so many companies get celebrities to endorse products and sell them to us. These two examples are great because they demonstrate how strategic ploy, the deliberate sowing and spreading of misinformation, can be used for good things. I don't doubt for a moment that Van Halen actually saved some lives with their M&M's trick. But these fellas all had control of their own narrative and got to decide when to tell the truth and let the real story come out. But it doesn't always work out that way. This, um, this next bit's a bit more serious, so I think I better change back to my regular teaching clothes. There's one more urban legend to tell you about, and that is that Cass Elliot, 
Mama Cass, died by choking on a ham sandwich. Now, like the other two stories, this one has a distinct agnogenesis. We know where it started. But before I tell you that, I want to stop the agnotology here and be very, very clear on what really happened. Cass Elliot died in London in 1974 at the age of 32 from heart failure. The doctor who had arrived on the scene to declare her dead noticed a sandwich nearby, speculated she may have choked on it, and reported that to the police. The police then reported that to the media. Well, you can imagine what the media did with that. Whether all of the players, the doctor, the police, the media involved, did this intentionally or unintentionally, we don't know. But regardless, one of pop culture's most indestructible urban legends was born. I want to take a little side tour here for a moment and tell you about something that people think is happening in the Cass Elliot story that isn't what's happening. And that's a psychological phenomenon called the Mandela Effect. Now, the Mandela Effect is named for Nelson Mandela because there's folks out there who believe he died in the 90s in prison. And he didn't. He died a free man in 2013. And you can verify that very easily pretty much anywhere online. The whole thing is a mass misremembering or a collective misremembering of the facts of the incident. And it's happened numerous times, generally because something is plausible and maybe something else in the news happened around the same time and people are getting stories confused. So it's not the same thing as agnotology. Agnotology is stuff that really deliberately happened. Mandela effect is something that didn't happen, but people think they remember it happening. To give you another example, this time again from the music industry, there's a Mandela effect about uh, Bob Geldof, who supposedly said the F word during the live broadcast of Live Aid in the summer of 1985. And he didn't. You can check the footage quite easily. It's out there online here on YouTube and other places. But it stands to reason that he would have. This was somebody who uses that sort of language all the time and was quite often causing trouble on television and was very passionate about the work he was doing that day. So it's not unreasonable to think that Geldof would have dropped an F-bomb on live television. He just didn't happen to do it in this particular case. So that's the Mandela effect, which is not what's going on in the Cass Elliot case. There really was news reports that Cass Elliot died by choking on a ham sandwich. So people aren't misremembering that, they're remembering it correctly. Cass didn't have control of her story. She was gone. So unlike Prince and Van Halen, she didn't get to make any decisions on when the truth came out. So the agnotology didn't benefit her the way it did for them. Her agnotology wasn't done for good purposes. To this very day, a lot of people repeat Cass's story as if it was fact, because it's one of those things that everybody knows. This is why when somebody says everybody knows or something is common knowledge, you have to question what really happened because this isn't common knowledge, this is disinformation. And disinformation isn't knowledge at all. So who set the agnogenesis of Cass's story into motion? Aside from the police, the media, and the doctor involved in her original time of death, why is it that after almost 50 years, we're still telling the same story incorrectly? Well, I have a couple of ideas on why that might be. Why do lies spread like wildfire, like they do? My favorite line from my favorite novel, from my favorite novelist, The Truth by Sir Terry Pratchett is, lies could run around the world before the truth could get its boots on. Why does any story get spread? Generally, it's because there's some sort of piece of it that's relatable, that resonates with us, or maybe it's just a really juicy bit of gossip. Or maybe it's because some people really like to see other people get their just desserts. And I think that's what's happening in Cass's case. Dying of a heart attack at the age of 32 is quite rare. It does happen, but it's rare. So the rarity of her cause of death might be contributing to why people tell the choking story because maybe that seems a little more plausible. But I don't think that's all that's going on here. 
Cass was a very large woman her whole life, and doesn't it seem awfully convenient that a woman who was overweight her entire life died by eating? There's a lot of people who see being overweight as a vice, as a sign of gluttony, and as something that deserves punishment and chastisement. And we say today in body positive movements that, you know, you can't shame somebody into weight loss, but that's a fairly new concept. That idea certainly wasn't around in Cass's day. So there's a lot of people who might be spreading that story because fat woman dying from food seems plausible and is a much better story to tell than a heart attack at 32. People want to believe that story because she got taught a lesson the hard way. Cass was a fairly unconventional woman for the 60s and 70s. She was very career driven. She was arts focused. She was all about creating new music. And for a lot of people at the time and occasionally some people to this day, a woman doing that was not okay. A woman was supposed to be at home, looking after her husband, being the happy little housekeeper and raising a whole bunch of children. And while Cass did have a family, she was very into flying around the world and doing tours and recording albums. She wasn't the homebody that was idealized at the time. So that probably also worked as a strike against her in the, the opinion people had of her as a person. And finally, it may help you to know that Cass Elliot was her stage name. Cass's name at birth was Ellen Cohen. She was Jewish. And now we have to step way back from this story and look at why is it the story is always told that she choked on a ham sandwich. And it's always a ham sandwich. It's never any other type of food and it's never any other type of sandwich. It's never egg salad. It's never cheese and tomato. It's always a ham sandwich. Why? Well, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure out that people who are anti-Semitic or racist in any sort of way are going to really take some glee in repeating the story that a Jewish woman, who also happened to be a woman of size and just a woman who was a career-focused person and not focused on a husband and kids, that she died by eating a non-kosher food. Do not doubt, dear friends that fat phobia or fat shaming, misogyny and anti-Semitism all go into why this story is repeated constantly for almost 50 years in exactly the same way. Now, some of you may be wondering what this has to do with agnotology. And this too is part of strategic ploy. Remember, we're looking at why people deliberately spread misinformation. So things like sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, fat shaming or fat phobia, ableism, all of those things all come under strategic ploy because somebody's benefiting from spreading that disinformation. One more time, bit from Robert Proctor. Ignorance has a history and a complex political and sexual geography and does a lot of other odd and arresting work that bears exploring. This is why those of us who do theoretical work or activist work in social justice issues say that these problems are systemic in our society. Things like sexism and racism and anti-Semitism and fat shaming and homophobia, none of these things are just simply a matter of a handful of bad actors who are doing mean things to people that they hate. These are things that are in the wool of the threads that we weave in the stories we tell in our society. This is also why you can be a good person with the best of intentions and a, and a good heart and never want to hurt anybody and yet still participate in racist or sexist or homophobic or ableist discussions and spread those stories. You can also benefit from these things socially because if you're not the person who's the target of that racism or sexism or so on, you're going to benefit by not being harmed by the repetition of these stories. And we have to be very, very careful that we don't just accept stories like this. It needs to be more suspicious that a Jewish girl died eating a ham sandwich. The fact that it's not is just how deeply rooted things like anti-Semitism are in our culture. 
And finally, we have to consider the importance of verifying these stories. Now, it may sound like it's not that important because, well, celebrities, right? But here's the thing. There's intersections. And those of us who share intersections with these various celebrities, be that our gender, our sex, our race, our culture, whatever, those of us that share those intersections are going to be harmed by these stories being spread as well. Because if we can believe that Cass deserved what happened to her, we can believe that of anybody. So there you have it, folks. Three examples of the most famous musicians whose most famous stories were never true. But we believed it for a time, and that is because of strategic ploy and agnotology. Before I sign off, I want to say an extra special thank you to my dear friend, Kenny Fitzpatrick, who did the voiceovers of the pieces from the Agnotology book by Robert Proctor and Londa Schiebinger. Kenny is the creator and host of the Q Review LGBT Music Project. His link is in the info box down below, so please visit him. He's on all platforms, and you can get some great music-themed merch from his store as well. So friends, thanks for watching. Keep questioning what everybody knows and common knowledge. And as I always say, lift heavy, fight the patriarchy, and I'll see you in the next video. I'm gonna eat the leftover brown ones. I got the peanut butter kind. I'm gonna be here for a while.